I guess uh, we want to uh, be on time I, in the end. So uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the new series of lectures that was organized by DCCFAR uh, Developmental Core. Uh, as you know, the main goal of uh, CFR Developmental Core is to facilitate career development of new investigators. And we thought that the best way of uh, learning uh, this uh, is from hearing uh, leading scientists. And we envisioned these lectures as uh, autobiographical uh, mm -hmm. talks by leading HIV investigators who will share details of their career uh, both scientific and social. And, and I think it is impossible to find a better person to present the inaugural lecture than uh, Dr. Robert Gala. So let me give you a very quick uh, biography of uh, Dr. Gala. Uh, and scientifically, he, I think, is an outstanding uh, investigator. He pioneered actually our field of human retrovirology when in 1980, uh, his lab discovered the first human retrovirus, HTLV-1. Uh, Dr. Gala was also a co-discoverer of HIV. And most importantly, he developed the HIV blood test in 83. So, but uh, all these groundbreaking discoveries were made possible by Dr. Gala's pre-retrovirology career in human immunology, because he is actually a discoverer or maybe one of the discoverers of uh, interleukin-2, which we all use now to culture T cells. So for his scientific accomplishments, uh, Dr. Gala was awarded a number of prestigious awards, including two Lasker prizes, actually, in 82 for uh, discovery of HTLV-1 and in 86 for discovery of uh, HIV. So Dr. Gala is a member of US Academy of Sciences, Institute of Medicine, and a number of other uh, organizations. After a long career at NIH, uh, Dr. Gala organized and uh, directs now the Institute of Human Virology in Baltimore. So I will not give you any more details of Dr. Gala's career. He may touch upon them in his talk if he wants. But one thing I want to mention is Dr. Gala's dedication to mentoring investigators at various stages of their career. And I think that's really relevant to uh, the purpose of uh, our uh, series. Uh, he is a co-founder and international scientific advisor of the Global Virus Network. Uh, the purpose of which is to facilitate collaboration between virologists uh, in different parts of the world. Of the world. So, before inviting Dr. Gala to speak, let me give, um, uh, give you one brief organizational detail. We have over 60 participants today from 28 organizations and four CFARs. And I'm sure some of you would like to ask questions to Dr. Gala. So please put your questions in the chat. And if time allows, I will uh, ask you to unmute and present your questions uh, to uh, Dr. Gala. And now it is my pleasure to give the podium to Robert Gala. Thank you very much, Michael. I do want to say if anybody did have questions and could stay longer, I, I really am free after the talk, so I would be more than happy to stay longer. Uh, I actually thought this was going to be, I took literally the form that was sent to me, Michael knows that, and I said, you know, really, uh, I'm inappropriate for this lecture because I came into AIDS, I was already an independent investigator a long time, so I cannot say anything about um, about independent becoming an independent investigator in HIV, I because I, I have no nothing to say about that. So I also thought it was to students. So when you see my first slide, forgive me, I won't waste your time because I was going to. I know that students love it to hear about failures of senior people, and so instead of talking about successes, I was going to tell about all my early things, which were all highly big failures. <laughs> so I wanted to bring that out a little bit. 
Okay, so let me let me start by going to that. So I won't, as I said, I won't take a lot of your time with it because this was for students. I did my first experiments in life when I didn't have any natural interest in science. I want to, I say that up front, all students and people who are in science, it wasn't particularly attractive to me. I played a lot of basketball and I was dating a lot and didn't think much of anything else until I went to college and memories of the death of my young sister um, haunted me a bit. She was my only sibling, she had leukemia and I started to think about it. And so in college, in my very first year, I, I sent home hundreds of mice to my mother to take care of. I had read in a dental office of a little pamphlet that said, no one knows the function of the thymus gland. And there's irony in this, because as you know, T cells begin in the, with precursor stem cells in the bone marrow, but they get to the thymus where they really become T cells. And my whole career is also haunted again, but it's by T cells this time, rather than a difficult memory. So I started out with T-cells and throughout my career, they've come back in and out of my career for uh, the various key steps that in my research. But so I decided that I would find the, um, what the thymus gland does because the little pamphlet said, no one knows what it does. So I dissected those mice, I, I mean, I operated on them trying to remove the thymus gland. And I found that in the first 367 died and I said, whoa, the thymus gland is really important. So I knew something, but then when I opened them up to look and see what was going on, I had cut the AR to the aorta of all of them. So I learned three lessons in this, that I would never be a surgeon and that you have to learn to walk before you try to fly. Uh, I didn't have the technology in short. I also learned that my nice Italian mother was not always that nice because one day I went home and the mice were all gone and she never acknowledged what she did with them. So I, I never was able to do anything further and probably was Good. In medical school, uh, well, uh, this is, I, I'm going to spend too much time on this. Let me just say that I find, I published papers in medical school, but before I did, I was working with the man who discovered erythropoietin. He was a Danish guy who came to Philadelphia. I worked in his lab and I was so scared to do the first experiments that I converted his lab into a massive number of bottles of reagents until one day he started to yell at me that I would never do an experiment and that shook me to my core because he was my hero. And then I began to do the experiments, but it was a little bit unfair. He wanted me to separate all cells of the bone marrow at every stage of differentiation. Of course, this has never been done before or since. And I had good idea for how to do it, but it was driving me a little bit crazy. Um, and so we went on to other things and things worked. At NIH, I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, once I was separating all the transfer RNA species. No one had done that before in mammalian cells. I did it twice in human cells. I had no technical help. It was a beautiful Saturday. We had these nine feet foot columns, uh, chromatog chromatography, reverse phase chromatography columns. We had to drill a hole through the ceiling of the guy upstairs or the gal upstairs in order to have the column continue to protrude. Um, that's really true. Not I wasn't the only one. Anyway, I put a sample on it and I, it was a beautiful day and I was getting tired. And so I put a pump on it to make it go faster. And of course the, the whole thing exploded. Uh, I lost every experiment. I went to see the boss on the following Monday and said, I, I just can't do this. I'll never make it. I don't have the patience and all that stuff. So he took me into his office. I was ready to quit. And he said, you know, 15 years or something like that before you, there was a young MD like you who didn't know a lot of technology like you, who was afraid of all those damn PhDs like you. And he said, and um, he was washing pipettes and he put the tubing in the wrong one in the wrong way. And he created a big flood in the whole laboratory. He too said he was going to quit. Well, I talked him out of quitting. Eight years later, he got the Nobel Prize for discovering how to make DNA in a test tube, DNA polymerase. His, his name was Arthur Kornberg. So he convinced me to try harder uh, and to pay more attention to the experiments. So I don't want to go into NIH with more problems because they weren't really so much my making. It was my guy I came to work with left to go to Duke and I was alone. And of all things, I was transplanted to the childhood leukemia wards for six months and then began to work in the lab. And as I say, slowly, slowly, there was some progress. My interest was in the origin and the pathogenic mechanisms of leukemias. My earliest studies were really What's, it's a weak thought just to compare the characteristics of some biochemical features of leukemic lymphoblasts from 
children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia with normal lymphocytes. And at the time, Peter Noel in Philadelphia had discovered phytohemagglutinin and could stimulate one mitotic event of lymphocytes. We didn't know T cells from B cells at the time, remember. And uh, they were just beginning to characterize cells that were more than antibody producing B cells, but it was not known really. But Noel found that phytohemagglutinin, this plant uh, product, could uh, make lymphocytes go through one mitosis. And it was believed that's all lymphocytes could do, T cells could do. B cells could grow more, but what were becoming known as T cells could only go through one division, it was thought. So we focused then on comparative biochemistry of these PHA stimulated cells because they were blast cells. They looked just like acute lymphocytic leukemia blast cells, almost identical. And the first thing I did was separate all the transfer RNA species and partially purify all the amino acyl tRNA synthetases, there being 20 of them and 64 tRNA iso accepting species. It was a nightmare of work. And as I, I was collaborating with a guy that I knew who just left Marshall Nuremberg's lab that I was supposed to join, but didn't because NCI made me a, a strong offer. And so I stayed wor working with Sidney Pesca and he just gave me guidance, but again, no technical help. There was a lot of funny things and I almost killed myself with high voltage electrophoresis separating uh, some, of these, some of the amino acids to make sure they were pure. Uh, Pesca didn't believe anything was pure that you bought from a company, so you had to go prove it was pure. And then I started to work in pyrimidine biosynthesis, purine biosynthesis, because they were important. We were learning about DNA at the time and DNA polymerases. And I was partially purifying DNA polymerases, the enzymes catalyzing the making of DNA from human cells. And we eventually characterized alpha, beta, gamma DNA polymerases. Now this ultimately, ultimately gave me an entry into retrovirology. Well, you'll know the reason why. Reverse transcriptase is in fact a DNA polymerase. And so I didn't like, like you, everybody in this audience, I'm sure, you don't like starting in a field at the very bottom. Well, I knew DNA polymerases and I knew therefore I could compete a little bit by getting into retrovirology in a strange way through biochemistry, through enzymology. And that's what I did while learning as I went along the virology. I was stimulated by my late friend, Dr. Robert Ting. He was my first Chinese friend, my first entry into Chinese culture. And he was a virologist who trained with the uh, great Salvatore Luria and then at uh, MIT, and then Renato Del Becco at Caltech. Um, and he, they were both virology people. And he told me that if I'm so interested in leukemia, I ought to get into animal retroviruses. They weren't called retroviruses, then they were called leukemia viruses or RNA tumor viruses. He said, because they cause leukemia in many species. And even if you could never, if one never existed in humans, you might learn something about the mechanism. So chickens, 1900, one of the first viruses ever to be discovered, avian leukosis virus. This is before Rouse and Rouse sarcoma virus. It's a retrovirus. Ludwig Gross in the 50s, laughed at for a decade, mouse leukemia virus. Bill Jarrett in the 60s, naturally occurring in leukemia in cats. And then cows and sheep by several veterinarian groups. And then in the 1970s, early Tom Kawakami in California, uh, given a leukemia virus causing myeloid leukemia, just like human CML. And then my colleagues and I in 1978, a uh, T cell leukemia virus of adult given apes. But there was a very strong resistance to look for human retroviruses at the time. Uh, let me go back and tell you that in this period, the 1960s, there was a healthy respect for infectious diseases. And the possibility of epidemics and pandemics, we could still remember polio. And then that allowed us to reflect back on some of the flu epidemics and pandemics. However, as I look back in history, we don't remember after a generation and a half. I believe that's true all the time. That's a big statement, but it's consistent with what I read historically. So by the 1970s, bias has appeared. Serious epidemic infectious diseases are over, it was said, in the industrialized world. They're just a problem for tropical disease institutes. These would not be politically acceptable no statements today, but they were said many times over. There, therefore, therefore, we shouldn't fund this kind of research. And you may or may not know that some major medical schools, Department of Microbiology, were terminated. And so in addition, 
it was widely believed, and I used to hear it all the time, retroviruses don't infect humans. There are many reasons for this. They not only don't, do not exist in humans, they can't. And I, I'll come back to that in a minute. And if you go to 1974 book on the origin of human cancer at Cold Spring Harbor, edited by Jim Watson and John Cairns of England, no viruses play any role in any cancer in humans. Okay, and the or book is Origins of Human Cancer, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, 1974. But by the 80s, early, the biases were overcome. Viruses are now known to be the cause or involved in a stage in the origin of about 20% of human cancers. I think it's, it's people estimate now about 22%. In some cases, or at least one, like HTLV1, the retrovirus, it does it all. No cofactors needed. For most others, cofactors seem to be needed. So if retroviruses were found in humans. They were shown to cause A, leukemia, A, paralytic neurological disease, and modest to moderate immune abnormalities. HTLV-1 in 1980, and then we discovered HTLV-2 in 1982, which is far less pathogenic, but nonetheless would be historically important because it indicated to us there might be more. One of the great pandemics in history appeared, as you all know, as well as me or better, caused by still another retrovirus. So let's look at how the developments occurred. The views were strong against the existence even of human retroviruses, as I said. It was, they were believed reasonably possible in the 50s, 60s, and up to the mid 70s. The virus cancer program at the National Cancer Institute was even formed looking in part for the, especially for retroviruses in man. But the many negative results were piling up. Decades for searching with negative results and some false starts. And it was said that when you have retroviruses causing diseases in animals, they replicate a lot, therefore they're easy to find if they were there. But they only studied those animal retroviruses that was easy to study. You, you know, people studying in a laboratory don't pick models that are hard. Naturally, they would select models where there's high tide of virus. There was little evidence in primates until the late 70s. And a group in California showed that in the presence of complement, human serum destroyed animal retroviruses. Therefore, humans were protected. Unfortunately, that was only true for a few of the small animals. They never tested anything else. And finally, human research, believe it or not, was far less appreciated. It was actually thought to be work that was, well, let's say less than mediocre. It was people, you know, who couldn't really do research. So it was not, it was looked down upon, period. And I know it's strange to hear that today because now everybody respects it and most everybody works on it. Cancer is catching as an infection seemed to be a primitive concept. They had no idea about what we call today slow viruses. My plan was this, any search must focus on a suspension culture of primary target cells. Why suspension culture? Solid surface colonies, they don't give you enough cells to do virology or biochemistry or molecular biology. And we need to use primary target cells because cell lines were giving us false news. And we need to activate and promote growth of these cells and not for one generation, but for many. Therefore, we need to find activating and growth factors for these cells. And we need very sensitive and very specific assays for a retrovirus, right? I think we'd all agree with this was, and I always thought, and this would be for younger people, perhaps in the room, if you're gonna take a big gamble as this was, and you know you're gonna get a lot of criticism as we did, you, gotta, you have to leave room to do the, other things that your colleagues are doing to show that you can do those things where the credibility level will be really low. And so let's, we need to talk a little bit about the growth factors. They're, you got to go back in this time period. They were just being discovered. Stanley Cohn at Vanderbilt, EGF, Rita Levy Montalcini in Rome, nerve growth factor. But these were the first growth factors. They got Nobel Prizes for these. And remember, these are autocrine. EGF is working on epithelial cells, nerve growth factor, and nerve cells. The concept of a cytokine where a cell of one lineage is affecting cells of another lineage did not exist and was thought to be absurd. But in 1971, we found that colony stimulating factor just discovered by Sachs in Israel and Medcap in Australia, which produced short-term minimal growth and terminal differentiation for granulocyte precursors. But we discovered it was made by T cells and we published it in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. Leo Sachs visited me, thought it was crazy, 
I said, I, you know, I don't have any idea about it. I really don't know. Maybe it is crazy, but that's what we find. It was the beginning of the concept of cytokines. But so, but nonetheless, growth was very limited on solid surface and certainly not applicable for our purposes. I returned to T cells as a source of factors because if I go back to where we found that growth factor, uh, if, rather, excuse me, where we found colony stimulating factor, it was from activated T cells, PHA stimulated T cells. I went back to them and this time, though it was working on the same cell lineage, it was surely a cytokine and cytokine biologists like Warren Leonard at NIH, uh, at least in my presence has called it the first real cytokine, at least the first defined one. We called it T cell growth factor. It allowed, it allowed us to produce large scale cultures in liquid suspension. And it proved that T cells could go through more than one mitotic cycle. I don't say this in the slide because I never did it, but immunologists took advantage of this for immune therapy and a bunch of other things, especially Steve Rosenberg, my colleague at NCI, and Ron Herbeman, who unfortunately prematurely passed away while at University of Pittsburgh. So it's widely used. I think you all know this in immunology today. It also brought my colleagues and myself to a necessary focus on T cells and T cell malignancies. But let me, before getting into some success, let me return to the specific and sensitive assay. We focused, I decided to focus on reverse transcriptase. You meant, we, I mentioned already how we have been working on DNA polymerases, and now we characterize reverse transcriptase, this viral DNA polymerase from a wide variety of animal retroviruses. We made attempts to distinguish it from all human cellular DNA polymerases. A development with synthetic template primers made by David Baltimore with collaborative research incorporated in, in Massachusetts by the head lab guy, Ori Friedman, led to exquisitely sensitive homo, oligo, and polymeric primer template combinations. For me, this was a key advance. The synthetic homo polymeric and homo oligomeric template polymers, primers or oligomers, were most useful. Oligo-DT, poly-DA, is virtually inactive with all reverse transcriptases, but active with all human cellular DNA polymerases. So a negative way of distinguishing. Poly-A as a template, ribo, with oligo-DT, is highly active with all reverse transcriptases, not with most cellular DNA polymerases, except the mitochondrial DNA polymerase gamma. Very useful when you know you have a retrovirus and for titering the virus. In fact, it's used. Sorry for the misspelling of titering, it should be one T. Uh, so th this is, if you, you know, people today, when you're titering virus, you might use P24, you might use PCR with, uh, for nucleotides, but you might use reverse transcriptase. And when you use reverse transcriptase, that's the template primer you'd probably use. But when you're trying to discover a retrovirus from, and, and show it's a retrovirus, you use something more specific. You show it's inactive with oligo-DT, poly-DA, and very active with poly-C uh, RNA, again, oligo-DG. DG being the primer, the director or the template is the poly-C. So that's the RNA, just like a reverse transcriptase, RNA directed, right? So that you can use the old-fashioned endogenous ribonuclease sensitive DNA polymerase activity, highly nonspecific. It just means you take particular fractions from a cell membrane or a media, or maybe a cell extract, and you get a particle fraction and you show you have DNA polymerase activity and it's sensitive to ribonuclease. So that therefore some, the template is RNA, but that's not true. It's often primed by RNA and that's what happens exactly with mitochondrial DNA polymerase. So you can really bark up the wrong tree. These are the advances that led to the discoveries of human retroviruses. In, in orange is what kept us looking and in white is what really led to the discoveries. So the finding of animal leukemia retroviruses by several groups. Temin's th provirus theory that our retroviruses went through a DNA intermediate that was integrated in DNA, also immensely controversial. In the 1960s, he was looked upon as ridiculous as Gross was looked upon for the animal leukemia viruses in the 1950s. And as we would be in the 1970s, 
for postulating and getting pre preliminary data for human retroviruses. The discovery by Temin in Baltimore, reverse transcriptase, an outline of retrovirus genetics by several investigators, but most prominent in the group is Peter Vogt. Making reverse transcriptase sensitive and distinct from sumum polymerases. That was David Baltimore and our group in the 1970s. Two things driving us to T cells, the capacity to grow human T cells by interleukin-2, the isolation of a new strain of given ape leukemia virus associated with T cell leukemia in 78. Reverse transcriptase discovery provided major advances. Of course, in molecular biology, it proved the provirus, well, it helped to prove the provirus theory was correct and immediate impact on our understanding of retrovirus replication. And as everyone here likely has used it and already, well, I'm sorry, that's for the talk at Cold Spring Harbor, that last sentence, you haven't been likely using it necessarily and you didn't speak about it already in, the, in any talk. But it was also a powerful tool that impacted molecular biology in several ways, like gene cloning and making cDNA probes for use in many things. But for my coworkers and myself, it was a surrogate marker, maybe, for a retrovirus. If we could get specificity and sensitivity, we did. And it did become the surrogate marker. It's roughly a 1,000 times more sensitive than electron microscopy. But even more important, it allows for the frequent sampling of culture like you can do this every 15 minutes for testing for a new virus, especially important for viruses released in periodic bursts as human retroviruses are often prone to do. Ultimately, we repeatedly isolated the novel retrovirus from CD4 human T cell leukemia cells. We called it HDLV1. Before we published, we re-isolated this virus several times. We proved that it was different from any animal retrovirus. We demonstrated proviral sequences integrated into the tumor DNA. And we found antibodies not only in the man, but in most of his relatives, most tellingly his mother. He clearly was infected by birth. He died from this virus shown in this picture. It's the first picture of a human retrovirus budding from the surface of the, his leukemic blast cells shown below. Here he is at age 28, about six months before he died. It's a very rapid disease in about 80% of cases, more chronic in about the other 20%. The lesions you see in his skin are frequent in this disease. They're infiltrates with leukemic T cells. Um, uh, this is a disease that is unusual in the United States. One found more often, but not solely, in African Americans, particularly those arriving from the Caribbean. But it depends on what tribes they came from in Africa, some very positive and some completely negative, and that's true of the Caribbean islands as well. But it's very endemic in Japan, Iran, Romania, Melanesia, the Aboriginal Australians, uh, and um, descendants of these people if they migrate, the, of, of all these, all those folks, and especially in South America, in Peru and Brazil. In fact, at the peak of AIDS, I was in Bahia, Brazil. And they told me if I went to the wards, which I didn't, I would see more HTLV disease than I would of HIV. So it depends who you are and where you are, whether it's important public health. But it is the first human leukemia virus. It's the only known leukemia virus. And it's the first human retrovirus. And everything else falls from it. The discoveries of the first human retroviruses directly led to the discovery of HIV. Conceptually, just look at that list. This wasn't an ingenious idea to look for a retrovirus if you were sitting in with us. This seemed to be not obvious, but a, a proper idea. Think of AIDS, where, what do you think the target cell is likely to be? When I, if you're thinking that it might be viral, I start to think of a cause, I start to think of what's the likely target cell. Well, the clinicians did the first scientific positive data. They told us CD4 T cells were dropping, that was likely the target. Well, HDLV1 and HDLV2 target CD4 T cells. We were hearing from Jim Curran, an epidemiologist at CDC, that whatever was going on, it seemed to be associated with blood, sex, and mother to infant. So if it's a virus, look at the transmission. What did we know about HDLV1 and 2? Blood, sex, mother to infant. Long latency to disease was obvious from the history. On the following of patients with AIDS. Well, 
that's certainly known for HTLV-1. You get infected from your mother and you have a likelihood of getting leukemia about 20 to 40 years later. The incidence of leukemia, is this is a highly oncogenic virus. Thankfully, it's hardly transmit, very poorly transmissible. And when it does transmit, it's usually with cells as the provirus rather than as a virus. It replicates so poorly. We know how to handle it to block its replication. We've handled it for many centuries. It's thought to be over 100,000 years in, in man, associated with man. So very ancient virus, which we've adapted to. But if you get infected, the likelihood of disease is very high. Overall, it's about 4% for leukemia, about 3% for the paralytic neurologic disease. And we don't know about the immunological diseases, but altogether, it's going to be over 10%. But Graham Taylor in Ohio has estimated that if you get infected from your mother, from, let's say from mother's milk, you have over 20% chance of getting leukemia. There's very few things that are that oncogenic. You almost can't think of anything, maybe asbestos. Anyway, what about immune impairment? Well, we know obviously in AIDS there was immune impairment, but the late uh, Professor Takatsuki, who just died last year, who described the disease, adult T cell leukemia, which is a great catalyst for our work, because this is causing a very specific leukemia, which he showed to be endemic in the southern islands of Japan, later found to be also in Hokkaido, but spread throughout Japan. He defined certain characteristics of that disease different from typical cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. Our clinicians never did until after it was apparent and obvious because we didn't see it so often. This became clear in a meeting in London when a clinical guy named Daniel Katowski pointed out that they were seeing patients coming to England, particularly from the Caribbean islands with this exact disease that Takatsuki was describing, very aggressive, often but not always with cutaneous involvement, often with high blood calcium mechanism is known but we won't go into that, and with a very aggressive course. The immune impairment, even in the absence of leukemia, occurs. So what if we have a variant of one of these retroviruses in man, and it happened to be able to cause more profound immune impairment? It's also, AIDS was also prevalent in Africa and in Haiti. These are two places HTLV-1 was prominent. Haiti was no, is known very endemic area for HDLV1. Technically, the methods for growing human blood T cells is based on our discovery of interleukin-2. Uh, there was no co-discovery. I want to tell that to Michael. It came from two postdocs with me and myself in 1975. We actually talked about it in 74. It came out in science in mid-1976. Well, our the second paper was in 1977, also by the our three people. And then after that, it was really heavily promoted by a group at Cornell that then split apart. But the finding of the growth factor itself was unequivocally from us. Technically, that came out of the HDLV1 research looking for a retrovirus. And the method of or sensitive and specific test for retroviruses is based on the reverse transcriptase work in the 1970s, and which also allowed the frequent culturing sampling, which is a necessity. There were nonetheless many ideas for the cause of AIDS beginning in 1982. Non-infectious were not wise. Popper is amyl nitrate as sexual stimulants, but you can sit there and say, how could they be thinking that when there were babies, when there were blood transfusion, when there were hemophiliacs? The answer to that was always escaped me. They would say, oh, they, they were probably taking amyl nitrate. Uh, autoimmunity was prevalent. Immunologists loved it. That meant rough sex. Blood cells were going from one person into another, and there was a reaction not only against the cells that were being donated, if you will, but also against one's own lymphocytes. And so autoimmunity, of course, that too didn't explain babies, didn't explain blood transfusions, because blood transfusions were occurring long before, long before uh, AIDS existed, of course. The same with the treatment of the hemophiliacs when they were using plasma. So, and also you might argue that rough sex was known before AIDS. Women had experienced it, hadn't they? So there were also many infectious ideas. There was a very good one that a specific adenovirus in 82 to 83, uh, Marshall and colleagues at Albert Einstein saw an epidemic among gay men 
around Albert Einstein of a novel adenovirus, but that turned out to be limited. And so that did, didn't move further, but it was a good idea with good data. There were other ideas of existing EBV variants or CMV variants. Mycoplasma, the Armed Force Institute of Pathology between 83 and 86, Montagnier proposed it as a necessary cofactor for years, that you couldn't get AIDS unless you had the retrovirus plus this, which of course is bogus. Then there was a new fungus. As early as 1984, when our papers, our four papers in science were in press and a paper of ours in Lancet in press, that turned out to be a contaminant. So the paper was withdrawn from the New England Journal of Medicine. Max Essex and I at Harvard uh, proposed in 82, the T lymphotropic idea of a new, a new retrovirus. That was the idea that gave fruit, that bore the results. However, I want to make it clear. We also made a mistake. Never would I have thought that there could be two separate kind of families which, whose similarities are from likely convergent evolution. There are a lot of similarities, but the genome is very distinct. That was a shock. As you were in the field, how many animals have two distinct exogenous retroviruses infecting them? I don't know of any. Here is human going to be the first one. When we just got acceptance of HTLV1 and 2, we're now going to have a completely different subgroup, a group, family of a retrovirus. Then there were the ideas that caused trouble in the field. There is no AIDS. Oh, there is AIDS, but there's no HIV. Well, there is HIV, but it's a passenger virus so led by Peter Duisberg in San Francisco, or that it was deliberately created by, of course, the United States. This was promoted by KGB in Russia. Um, sorry, Michael. But that was the case, and it was acknowledged so. It then was fed to East Germany to a Professor Siegel, a geneticist, caused me, you guys don't know that, but uh, caused me plenty of trouble, so much so that I had to be for three weeks taken home at night. You know, Fauci likes to talk about it as this as a modern phenomenon, but I was taken home by um, government agents with dogs for three weeks because I got credible assassination levels for creating the virus. So that that's because I worked with more than one virus, therefore I must have created it. But that was... Uh, that was the KGB, the German KGB, if you will, uh, phenomenon. Okay, but finding viruses one thing and showing the cause was another, and AIDS had presented unique challenges, unlike past viral epidemics or the recent SARS. The latency, you don't, doctors don't ask what people did 10 years ago or seven years ago or five years ago. They ask what you did last week, last month, yesterday. And by the time a person has AIDS, which is the only way you could recognize it, was when they had either Kaposi's C sarcoma, they start testing them, but there was no blood test, but they start thinking of AIDS or multiplicity of microbial infections. So which one was the cause? As it turned out, none were the cause. All these evident infections, none were the cause. We had a lot of help from clinical scientists at the time. The most prominent, the most helpful are listed on the slide. You can um, see that at the bottom. I want to say a minute, the clinicians helped me a lot, not just providing samples. We had a lot of discussions. So I don't want to underplay that as if they just sent a sample and went away. This is both a major step forward and a major setback for my colleagues and myself. It's never been published except on the cover of Journal of Pathology by a Johns Hopkins pathologist editor in his journal when I gave a talk there. I happened to show this slide, but we never published it. It was February 1983, an important point in time. Samples were brought to me by a French colleague named Jacques Leibovitch, who died last two years ago of lymphoma. And Jacques brought about five samples from France, encouraged me. He liked the ideas we were talking about, but he wanted me to work. He was a funny guy. He said, you need to work more on HIV. And the, one of the samples he gave me was from a young Frenchman who was on his honeymoon in Haiti. He was uh, in a car accident, which happens to most people who go to Haiti and drive. And uh, he died with AIDS. We got the sample, cultured it. The cells grew. They grew well. And um, they cross-react with monoclonal antibodies developed by Marjorie Guroff in our group to HDLV1. But it clearly wasn't HDLV1. Look at the morphology. So the morphology looked weird, mixture of things sort of, but you wouldn't think mixture. You just thought this was the virus with strange maturation phenomenon. But also 
It was cross-reacting with HDLB1, yet it was cytopathic. It was killing the cells while they were growing. We didn't put one and one together and come out with two. I think we did what most people would do since our thoughts were that this was going to be in the HDLB family. We assumed that this was one virus, as you naturally would assume, because two retroviruses are not supposed to infect the same per person, exogenous retroviruses, and especially not the same cell. So we had no way. We knew a little too much about animal retroviruses that we were led in the direction that it had to be exactly what we were predicting. It would be in the HTLV family in a new human retrovirus. But it turned out that we could only reproduce this rarely. It turned out to be about 2% of our isolates were like a little like this. Um, we didn't go into electron microscopy, but we could get the cross-reaction with HTLV-1 because we would learn they were double infected and usually they were drug addicts. Well, this guy was blood transfusion. Sometimes blood transfusion would give us these double infections. My colleague Mika Popovic was able to separate out the two eventually. And we said, oh my God. And then we knew how to publish and what to publish. We also knew something else. The positive side of the slide is that HIV is growing in an immortalized leukemic T cell line, right? So we also knew how we could ultimately solve the conceptual breakthrough of having massive amount of virus. When we published, we had a total of 48 isolates from 48 different patients. That was one of the four science papers. And so one that my name is first. And then we, we reported in PNAS 105 isolates as there were now some additional isolates from Paris, but I felt, our group felt, it was still dangerous for us to publish and to conclude that HIV was the cause of AIDS because verification is going to be necessary. And verification by virus isolation would be very difficult from other groups because tissue specimens were limited, not even allowed in some places. The T cell culture technology, not widely available in virology labs at the time. And AIDS had to be clinically recognized. And by that time, the patients generally had very few T cells in their blood to culture, making virus isolation very tricky. In fact, when I tell you we had all these isolates, let me tell you we had hundreds of cultures in our lab. I mean, they were all over the place in at least four different laboratories working with me. I mean, people with me in, in our space, but separated by walls. And all those cultures, we would get, let's say if we had 10, we might have positives in three and seven negatives. So this was really dangerous. We didn't know what was going on. And but what was going on is we were getting some AIDS samples that were so few T cells that you couldn't culture anything. So the consequence of all this is that few groups were involved, right? Michael, how much time do I have? If any. About uh, 15 minutes okay. left. Well, you, you give me a little extra. In the fall of 1983, a major advance was made. And this is the paper by Popovic et al. in our four papers. The capacity to continue to grow several, turns out to be six, if you look at his paper, of our isolates of HIV. This made several things possible. The characterization of the viral genes, the proteins, but the blood test. That made drug screening also possible. It made molecular analysis easy, et cetera. My technicians that I assigned to work with make a Betsy Reed Canole now works as a project officer at NCI. And Ursula Richardson, unfortunately, died um, well, she died prematurely. So when we had this, the, when this advance was made, it was the first time, honestly, honestly, that we could smile. We looked at each other and said, this does not tell us the cause of AIDS. But in two months, we will know. How will we know? Because we knew we could make a blood test. And we knew everybody could do a blood test to syrup go all, be available all over the world. So we knew that if it was negative, this thing isn't causing AIDS. But if it was positive, we'd have the cause. So we know yes or no in a couple of months. And indeed, we did. And we submitted the papers. So the blood test verified etiology. It was safe to work with, simple, sensitive, accurate, inexpensive, rapid. Verification came fast. 
enabled surveys of thousands of serum samples globally, and it removed all doubts for us to publish. It was a key advance. Yeah, it was saving the blood supply, preventing blood transfusion and the consequent infections from the recipients to others. But more importantly, or I shouldn't say more important, it allowed the epidemic to be followed for the first time. Before that, you had to wait till someone had AIDS. It allowed the first screening of anti-HIV drugs, the culture system. When therapy became available, we could determine who to treat, as well as the block mother to child transmission. It's never really been thought of that much, but those are the facts. For me, it verified HIV as the cause of AIDS. There were major advances that happened at that time. You know them, they came fast and furiously, and I'm not going to go through these to leave time for questions. Um, one of the important added contributions we got into a little bit later was the first endogenous inhibitors of HIV. We showed that the beta chemokines or anthes, MIP1 alpha, MIP1 beta, potently blocked HIV infection. Um, and we found they were produced by both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Uh, Jay Levy had thought they came from only CD8 cells. He didn't identify what it was, and this is what they are. This led to, of course, the help lead to the discovery of the HIV co-receptors, not CD4, but CCR5 and CXCR4. <clears throat> there was already headway being made by Ed Berger and his colleagues at NCI, but the, no doubt the CCR5 was stimulated by the beta chemokines because they blocked entry. We knew they blocked entry, but we didn't know how. Our lab was moving at that time from NIH, from the Cancer Institute to Baltimore to the new institute. And we had a, obviously a delay, almost a year's delay. Now therapy, I'm gonna end with therapy. I'm not gonna get into vaccine because of time. You know, what? you have, I, everybody in the audience knows the cocktail. That got all the publicity, but it was not the breakthrough. It was thought not possible to target systemic viruses because of the precision needed in therapy. Viruses, as you know, lack metabolism. They're not like the bacteria, the fungi, parasites, the protozoans, which have a metabolism. But advances in the 1970s from molecular biology on virus replication, including the replication of retroviruses, opened the door. It gave more laser sharp ideas for therapy and drug development. So now you could really think about doing something, understanding HIV replication cycle. That was a critical advance for therapy to develop. The beginning was 1985, in my mind. This is what is historical. In vitro, Sam Broder came to my lab with Mitsui from Japan. And he used the cultured CD4 T cell system with my colleague Marvin Wrights helping along the way. We collaborated with Burroughs Welcome at the time. And AZT was found to inhibit reverse transcriptase greater than the human cellular DNA polymerases. And then they showed it inhibited HIV infection in cell culture without great cytotoxicity. But I was sure worried about clinical trials because this thing does have some inhibition of DNA synthesis of normal cells. But Broder and Bobby Arsharn, Bob is still working at NCI, along with David Berry at Burroughs Welcome, showed its efficacy in vivo. CD4 was increasing, HIV declining. I believe that's a historical first of objective evidence that you can knock off a systemic viral serious disease and get improvement. In any case, it brought the pharmaceutical industry into the problem. Combination therapy is obvious. So it's known to, we use it in cancer, we use it in syphilis, we use it in tuberculosis, we use it in many diseases. We use it even for hypertension, trying to hit different pathways, et cetera. And it only, but it got all the publicity, even covers of major magazines, et cetera. But what happens is the, first, the early event with AZT led many pharmaceutical companies to enter the field. So the combination therapy is obvious, it just had to wait until they develop the drugs. That's the success of the cocktail. The combination of drugs went forward and worked even better, much better. So where are we today? I think this is my second to last slide. It's a focus on cure, but what do we mean by cure? In my mind, there's not a single, single bit of strong evidence for a cure, and I include the Berlin patient. 
Proviruses exist in hidden places, especially in the brain. Were they searched for it in the so-called Berlin patient after he died? And has anybody here seen him? I, I have, I, you probably, some of you probably have. He certainly looked like a dying AIDS patient. Of course, he had some leukemia come back as well. But this, this man suffered an awful lot with lots of complications. And they weren't all from his leukemia. And I don't believe it was ever proven that he didn't have any proviral DNA. In any case, if one means a virological cure, I say that it hasn't been proven yet. It's likely unachievable except by extreme measures. We're not gonna total body radiate somebody and give transplants unless they have leukemia or lymphoma or something like it. So if you mean cure to mean no more therapy is going to be needed, then it is doable, probably. The approaches have been shock and kill. I I'm, just gonna, I'm not gonna have time to go into why, but from the beginning to now, I don't think this is a workable notion. The concept of block and lock, which I think all of you know, it means except keeping some proviruses, block it and block virus expression and keep it locked. So you have low or no virus detection at all forevermore. A third, and I think very doable is happening, very long lasting drugs. That is happening now. And then there's targeting the provirus with CRISP technology. Great ideas. I don't know what to say. I'm insufficiently expert to make a prediction on it. I, I mean, if I had a bet on any of those four, I would take C and, and, and stay with it for a while intensely. This is my last slide, really. I think we ought to squeeze pathogenesis much harder. We are coming to the end point of studying replication of the virus and getting new ideas for drug development. Yes, we can deliver them better. Yes, we can make them last longer. But there are a few steps in the replication cycle that haven't already been exploited. Yes, there'll be refinements of it here and there. But I think along with the pioneers in this field, like Bruce Walker and the consortium that he leads, maybe Steve Deeks as well, there are others. Paul Felt in Germany, the elite controllers, determine how they control HIV without therapy for many years. Finding what differs functionally in them may be rewarding for therapy. This is the direction my colleagues and I are in, <laughs> sentence is screwed up. Sorry, I was in a hurry with this one. This is the direction it should read that my colleagues and I are, are now going. And uh, we'll have two papers um, being submitted shortly for publication, which I hope will be accepted together. I don't think there's any time for discussion of vaccines, um, but I wanna thank Michael um, for this invitation. And I wish all the interested young persons here will be well supported as we were in our youth. I know it's much harder now and that you'll have the same very good luck that I had. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bob. That was a really amazing uh, story and uh, both historical and uh, for kind of future of uh, HIV research. Uh, let me just ask you one question. Um, I don't know whether other people want to join, but I just wonder when we talked with you before your lecture, you, you mentioned that uh, you think that HIV field uh, in general will uh, kind of uh, deteriorate. And I understand that uh, that's probably due, uh, if we get back to uh, kind of no new infections uh, and all infected people eventually die, uh, then yes, but, uh, but I don't think that's really feasible to expect that there won't be any new uh, HIV infections. So why do you think that this field would uh, Oh, it'll always, it'll always need clinical people. Will it, will, will it need people like you or me? And, I mean, I'm not as young as you, so let's count me out. But will it need you? And will it need young people coming into it? You and I would say yes. But I mean, I can only go, what am I, in, I there's no, you must understand, there's no gain in me taking this position, only loss. So, but I'm trying to tell the truth as I see it. And I, I I've been in science now, you know, it's getting close to 60 years, six zero. 
<laughs> I mean, and things, you know, things change, right? What, what you can be sure of in life other than death and taxes is change. Things don't stay the same. And there'll be pressures from other fields and other big problems. And AIDS, you people will argue, is treatable. They live a reasonably normal life. You, We all know that if you're involved in AIDS and you can see part people, that there's a lot of comorbidities still, even in the best treated people. We know that, especially at the HCV and other things, that there's comorbidity and they don't live as long and they don't live as well. It's not just that they, some people say, oh yeah, in AIDS, they just don't want to take five pills. You know, they, and you take them for hypertension, you take two or three, you take maybe five pills a day. So what's the big deal? But it's not normal yet. So we would favor the research, but I, look, I'm telling you what I did. At IHV, oh, geez, at least 10 to 15 years ago, I said, we, we must diversify the portfolio. We have to. Or, or, and the Institute is doing really well. Um, I shouldn't say that because it's good to have people sorry for you, sorry for you, maybe don't donate, but we're doing well. But uh, we did diversify a bit, you know, and not saying we're not doing well, well HIV or doing okay, but I worry that that won't be the case long, long term. You know, I, if, if, if we didn't have an epidemic of drug addiction in Baltimore, AIDS would be very low. But in the black population and the Hispanic population, we have a big drug epidemic. So the gains we made have been wiped out. So where do we get money from? Oh, we're moving more to NIDA, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. from that nice Russian lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, so that's what I mean. I just think I wouldn't tell people not to go into HIV. Clinically, you're always going to be needed and new ideas clinically will be needed. But I wonder about the basic science investigator. If you're solely relying on HIV, I would make sure I have some clinical collaborators. I, in our institute, we do. I mean, we just recruited Lee Shan Su from North Carolina. He was a tenured professor there. He's very good. He has a lot of R1s, but he wanted to come to our institute in particular because of the close clinical collaboration of, of patients with the direction he's heading. He's a PhD. But, he, but he, you know, he's got his noodle is telling him, I better find some clinical people to interact with. It's going in that direction. So I would tell if, 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 if I was a consultant to GWU, I would say the young investigators that are PhDs or MDs doing basic research purely have some clinical friends. That's all I want to say. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think it's the best way I can put it. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Bob, there is a question. Uh, Alan Greenberg has. Yes, uh, Dr. Gal, even though I knew the end of the story, I found your telling of it today and retelling of it riveting. And um, I, I really felt my heart pounding as you were going through the discovery process. And I just thank you for sharing it so much. Um, when you, when, uh, I mean it sincerely, it was, it was riveting. When, when you look back at your career in life and think about what were the key um, things that propelled you towards your success, given that we have some junior people on the phone, some students, some um, junior investigators. So oh. What do you think some of those keys were that made you successful and others less well? I'm laughing, Alan, because at lunch today, and I'm at home today, I'm talking to my wife, and I don't know how we got into this. It was over some friends having, can you hear me? Because I just stopped hearing you. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, and we, it was over a discussion of some people, friends that died in the past year, two years. And so it was a horrible, a lot, you know, but that happened not from just COVID. It was just, you reach an age when a lot of friends pass away. So we were going through that and then I started reminiscing. And actually I said exactly that. I said, you know, I never thought of this, but I could make bullet points, the things that hurt, the things that helped, the things that were absolutely necessary. One of the things I said was that I, I was really hurt in the 1970s, bad, really bad, because people didn't believe in human retroviruses at all. And I was getting these hints, and even with the discovery of HTLV-1, a massive amount of the data uh, went to J-Virology with the first paper, and I got it shot down by the late Bob Wagner. It was like a Dear John letter from a, from a girl to her boyfriend in the army. 
like, Bob, please go away. Don't come back anymore. This is terrible. I don't believe it. We just don't believe anything. And I, I agree with the reviewers. I, that letter is on my wall, you know, framed. So I, it was bad. I'd come into a meeting and I remember, I won't say names, a few of them are famous people, one with the Nobel Prize, would say, we used to call the viruses RNA tumor viruses, but here comes Bob with his RNA rumor virus. So what happened? This is, no, that's bad news. Those are points where I was, did I ever come near quitting? Yeah, probably, probably just around that time. It was like, this is getting ridiculous. I'm, I'm hurting my staff. I'm hurting myself. I can compete with these guys, but you know, it's, I'm getting insulted. It's tough. It's, it's, but then I, you know, I thought of the stories about Ludwig Crokes. I didn't, and I knew the stories about Howard Temin that were miserably treated. And parenthetically, I'll tell you that Malcolm Gladwell, the famous author, who I'm a little friendly with, he did a podcast. You should go hear it. It's the Obscure Virology Club. And he was interviewing me and he never told me what he was going to do. But it's Ludwig Gross, who he asked me about for a long time, at least an hour and a half. And then Howard Temin is in the middle. He was the cement. And he asked me about him for a long, long time. He interviewed a lot of people. And then he came and told me. He said, you're going to be the third in the club. Each of you had a de decade of misery. The 50s for Gross, the 60s for Temin, and the 70s for you. So it was a really awful time. And then there was it being escorted by police with dogs because you created the virus. The problem with the patent that I never patented anything in my life, but we were told that it had to be patented by the government and that created problems with Pasteur because we didn't patent it, the government patented it. We didn't award it to us, the world did. Everybody, Europe, America, because we had a working test and could grow the virus and they didn't. They never made a blood test. It was bullshit. They never made any blood test. Whatever they patented was 17% of AIDS patients positive, which you could do better with your eyes. They used immune fluorescence. They couldn't grow the virus. They had all kinds of false positives. But um, that created another monumental problem for me. I said, well, what am I doing in this? So my friend, the late John Piero di Mallorca, chairman at Rutgers of Microbiology, came to, from Italy, from Milan. I was trying to make a decision whether I'd work on AIDS or not. And he told me I was nuts. And I went, he said, you know, you have, just have a scotch, enjoy your life smoke a cigar, and just sit there and wait and watch. You've already got enough. That's what he was saying. Don't get into any problems. He said, AIDS will give you only headaches, danger, and if you're right with your ideas, it'll cause competitive, I don't, I don't want to say what he said, but it'll cause people, some people, to react against you even for being right. And if you're wrong, you're dead. And he said, that's it. So I went to bed that night, and you know, I'm like some of you. I'm sure Michael's this way. I'm a bad boy, and I decided I must get into AIDS tomorrow ferociously because, you know, I don't like to be told what to do and not what to do. So I said, John Piero, you know, to, you know, jump out the window. I'm going to do that. So he said, you're going to regret it. Okay, so, you know, you're rethinking how stupid was I to get into this problem. The, but before, before that, you know, going back to just human retroviruses, before when HDLV1 was then rejected. Here comes a good, I said to my wife, like, how can I ever forget three people? They're all in the generation ahead of me. They're the late Henry Kaplan, Stanford, used to be at NYU, first went to cure cancer, radiation therapy for Hodgkin's. He was a retrovirologist also, radiation leukemia. Hilary Kaprowski, the director at Wistar, all older, all dead now. Uh, and Maurice Hilleman, the vaccinologist at Merck. Henry Kaplan, I was the first person at NIH to have a review. And Vince DeVita was friendly with me, the Cancer Institute director, and he decided at NIH we'll have outside reviews. I said, why me? I'm supposed to be your friend. He said, because you. He, was, he says, I give you even extra support sometimes when people are criticizing that why are you working on this crazy disease when you're in the Cancer Institute? I said, just tell them Kaplan's E sarcoma and lymphoma, okay? And he said, no. He said, you're gonna have six people, three members of the National Academy. You know, this is, when is this? This is 1978, 79, right? And I'm, you know, I, yes, I'm in the Academy, but I didn't get in until mid eighties. And so Henry Kaplan was a tough, tough guy. 
known for being a tough guy, high integrity. So he, he had these abnormal fingers from radiation damage. He was a radiation therapist. And he was poking them in my chest at the end of the meeting. And he said to me, you know, Gallo, he said, you did what I wanted to do my whole career. This data was still controversial. He reviewed it intensely. He's very smart. And I didn't know this was good news or bad news. I said, Jesus, and competing with him, and maybe he's going to be a bad guy. And not. So he said, I want to sponsor your paper for the National Academy of Sciences. And then David Baltimore sponsored the second one, and life was good. I had two wonderful years after that, almost three. No, nothing but goodness. Then AIDS came, and it was the whirlwind and, and ups and downs. But uh, so a positive punctuation point is, what if those guys didn't enter my life? You know, I got in the academy because something like 25 Nobel Prize winners wrote a letter overruling everything and anything. And you could do the alphabet by their names. You could, you could probably guess a lot of them. But I mean, I had all the, all the you know, for B, there was Bird, Panasseret, Baltimore. Right? For A, there was Chris Anderson. There, there was Kornberg, you know, <laughs> the DNA polymerase, you know. Uh, Del Becco, you could go through the alphabet. I had all these guys writing letters for me. So if that didn't happen, what would have happened? So if Tenman didn't discover reverse transcriptase or predict it, if he and Baltimore discover it, we would never have the idea of entering in the field. I would have had no opening. I'm not sure I would have had the courage to enter virology, let alone retrovirology, with nothing in hand. So those are really, were really key things. Staying, having a great young people around me as I went through, to be honest, I was quite depressed in that period of AIDS early on because it seemed like we could, no matter what we did, there was a problem. And I remember then gay activists who became our supporters, but at the beginning were not. And they came to me after I said, we just showed the cause, made a blood test. Why aren't you happy? They say, you just made our insurance go up. You did nothing for the dying friend I have or anybody else. I said, don't tell me you're expecting therapy too. They don't have any therapy against systemic viral diseases. We talked past each other. But then I realized when Martin Delaney visited me for a, a day, he ended up being on our board when I went to Baltimore. He died of, uh, not of AIDS, he died of liver disease. Or um, I forgot. Yeah, from HCV disease. Um, Martin Delaney spent the whole day and an evening and talked all night. And he, and he ended up saying, you're nothing like I thought you were. And I said, well, what did you think? And he said, you know, we, anyway, we compared all kinds of notes. And he got the whole gay community turned around like that. And I started understanding from their perspective, seeing people dying right and left. So I started saying, you know, yeah, if I were in their position, that's what I'd be thinking. What the hell? Yeah, oh, yeah, you know, cause, big deal. It's a nice thing for, for you. It's a nice thing for the field. It's a beginning for us, but a very beginning, beginning. We're dying still. So those are memory points. So you just dig your heels in harder and start to try to work more practical. So I turned towards therapy too. So that period of AZT, I did what I could do and then realized I, I, you have to know yourself, right, Alan? You need to know yourself. And for me, I know I'm more interested and I'm better equipped upstream than downstream. I am not good at the practical angle so well. A lot of people are much, much better than I am. So when you say, okay, we're over here, we have the cause, we have mechanisms, we're really going coming down, and it needs this, that, and the other that's very practical, I'm less inclined to be intensely interested, and probably part of the reason is because I know not as effective. So um, I'd say learning to know yourself was a, was a big part of this, and uh, knowing my limitations, having a great young group with me, and there were a lot of them in time. So I grew from nothing to a little bit. And then when I was going to go to Marshall Nuremberg's lab, I just won the Nobel Prize for breaking the genetic code. NCI wanted to keep me. They did. They offered me more positions. I grew to a section. Then I had these wonderful young people that kept me going when everything seemed to be going to hell in my, in my life at that time, where you think it's a great period for me. We never had any celebration, ever. Bill Hazeltine shows me his lab is full of champagne bottles. We didn't have any champagne bottles. It was never a eureka moment, except maybe when... When the, the, when, the cell, when the virus really got to grow and continue its cell line, we were smiling, but we never had a celebration ever. You know, there was always troubles. There's the troubles with Dingle. There was the troubles with, you know, all this, the patent stuff. There was the troubles with creating the virus and having that problem. There was the troubles of being targeted for not having therapy for the disease. 
oh my gosh, and you know, being painted as um, what I wasn't. I, I, I always said in those days, a simple statement, I hope you don't take it as pompous, but I used to say people are overestimating me here and underestimating me here. <laughs> so, you know, they were thinking that, oh, you could solve the problem. I've heard somebody said you could have solved the problem at will. Oh, yeah, sure. They could solve the problem at will. In the earliest days, you know, we just didn't run it. Or that I said I didn't want to work on it because it was only six gay men in New York. You know, that's because I speak openly. And I said something that's parallel, but nothing like that. When I first heard Jim Curran talk, there were six people he was talking about in New York. So, of course, I said, I'm not leaving cancer research to work on a disease of six people. But the second time he came, and I thought he was looking at me, he said, where are the virologists? And now it was a serious disease. I went back to the institute, excuse me, my lab at that time at NIH. I remember a sunny day. I, I remember the period. Our first experiments were May 1982. So this was probably May 1982, the beginning. And I, we, talk, we had a discussion. People agreed with me. I said, you know, we know quite a bit about T cell culturing and T cell biology now. And maybe we have some obligation here. Let's think of what, let's think about this together. And the, I said credit to the young people because at that time I was getting into a depressed state. I had also family trouble and you know um, some serious sickness and personal trouble. And it didn't seem like everything at one time was um, going, was bad. And even, even the success of publishing, you know, they say I publish more papers in science and nature than anybody ever. Okay, great, but it, it wasn't feeling good. There was no joy. There was always trouble. And every time we did success, you think of what you haven't done. Okay, next, oh yes, is there a virus in the brain? We better find out, you know, then on the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. There was never ability to stop and just, you know, enjoy it. That doesn't happen with HIV in those days. It's different now, much, much different. And for many years, it's been different. But if you tell me what I like to experience that time again, not really, not really. And a lot of exciting observations, a lot of novel things, a lot of careers were made in the younger people that work with me. Mandy Fisher went off and became a member of the Royal Society of England. And two postdocs that became members of the National Academy. And one became Cancer Center Director at Columbia. Um, and a lot of people had good success. And um, yeah, that's all what I can say. I don't know. Thank what you for sharing your, your experiences and wisdom. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Bob. I believe that uh, it would be nice to, to have you in person someday. But you didn't invite uh, me, Michael. You never invited me. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Do you know? Uh, I just, no, we'll, 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 we'll arrange for, for a different reason. Maybe just uh, we all share personal stories. That's the deal. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know we don't but have to. Yours are so fascinating. I, I really well, enjoy it. I mean, probably sure. we'll live as long as I have. You, you, you'll have stories too. Just keep. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Vivian told me that we need to wrap up because our uh, Zoom is coming to an end. So, Bob, uh, thank you so much again. It was really great, great pleasure. Michael, I would never turn you down. You know that. I liked you from the day I met you and respect you from today. <laughs> Well. And I'm glad to see your CFAR is still kicking away, right? Is it yeah, real? it's doing very well. Good, good for you. Thanks, Colin. Good. good luck, all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Dr. Gallo. <clears throat> Thank you for saying so. The process. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Take care, Alan and Michael.